and I'll now introduce um, our speaker tonight, Carl Stolker, who, as I say, is well known uh, to this audience. Um, after a long and distinguished career, he's now the uh, emeritus curator of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, he's a significant expert on Thy Angelica, so we're very lucky to have him telling us about it. And he's currently working on a major a Fry Angelica show, which I think uh, is scheduled to start at the Strozzi in 2025. So um, uh, we're hearing about one of the great artists of the Quattro Centro from somebody who actually knows quite a lot about it. So over to you, Carl. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Um, well, today, I believe, is Ash Wednesday. And therefore, the slides don't go up. <laughs> huh? Let's see if I can do it this way. It is a vote. Oh, okay. So, Ash Wednesday. This is a pro-angelical painting of the temptation of Christ. Uh, uh, the uh, dormitory of San Marco, convent of San Marco, and the museum of San Marco. And of course, he was tempted for 40 days, and finally, at the end, he was able to be uh, served by the angels' wonderful food and wine. And so that will happen to all of us 40 days from now. But today, if any of you are Yankees, and I don't know, uh, you might remember that the 22nd of February is a special day in America. It's George Washington's birthday. And uh, George Washington, uh, you know, we talk a lot about him nowadays, was kind of a mythic figure, uh, just like Frangelco became a rather mythic figure. This is what Grant Wood, it shows George Washington, the famous incident of when his father acute said, did you ch uh, 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 chop down a cherry tree? And he said, no, my hatchet did. And this is Frangelico painted by, or engraving rather, of showing him in prayer, before, the, uh, before he painted a Madonna or a crucifixion, which is a story which comes from Vasari. So they're both people who are growing up in this. In America, we used to love having uh, February 22nd as uh, uh, George Washington's birthday because it, you, it was celebrated on that day. And we also had the same month of February, a very short month, the 12th of February, which was Abraham Lincoln's birthday. So we got two holidays. And, around the shortest month of the year, made it quite nice, but then they changed it. And so now it's only President's Day, which was last Monday. Uh, but also this month, the World Catholic, I suppose, you could also have Frangelico Day. And I'll explain later why last week, uh, Frangelico celebrated at the altars of various churches in Florence and elsewhere. Um, here again, as we're talking about Frangelico became a mythic figure in the 19th century, whether it be in England or particularly also in France, where there are a couple of paintings which celebrate Frangelico crying before the crucifix or praying before the painting or something like that. Um, it all kind of started with the, pre, uh, the Nazarenes, or, or German pre Raphaelites, you might say, in which this particular painting, The Triumph of Religion, in art I just saw last week in. Um, Frankfurt by Overbeck, in which you see Frangelico talking to his almost near contemporary, Jan van Eyck. The, um, the uh, engraving here was actually made in England for the promotion of fine arts in all places in Scotland. And so it was supposed to be a, a sort of, uh, Frangelico was supposed to be a model painter for Scottish artists at that point. And the English actually were very interested in Frangelico in the 19th century, and they sent down the Arundel Society, which was a promotion of the arts of the society, actual club in uh, London, sent down artists to make copies of works by Frangelico. And this was a copy of actually not only of a, one of his miniatures in the prior book of the um, of the church, of San Marco, but also a copy of miniature painting on parchment. And they did other ones, there's numerous of them. They're almost all now in the Victorian Albert Museum, in which you see um, copies, this one of one of the frescoes in, uh, in the Vatican. And one of the greatest lovers of Frangelico was Prince Albert himself. In 1845, he bought that painting you see on the left of St. Peter Martyr as a Christmas present for the Queen. 
and the uh, next year she gave him a copy of that painting, a, a, a black and white copy, but a painted copy of the Triumph of Religion Arts by, by Overbeck. Um, and then later in 1846, she gave him as his, for his birthday, this beautiful drawing of, of uh, by, um, possibly by Benito Sogosi or Beato Angelico of a head of a cleric and a group of figures which relates to that chapel, which I showed you in, in the Vatican. In fact, you, we all know that uh, Prince Albert died at one point and uh, Queen Victoria went in deep mourning, but anything that sh had to do with uh, Prince Albert throughout the rest of her life really uh, was important to her. So actually when she came to here in Florence in 1893, she went to the Uffizi or just uh, installed the lift and she had it, she was able to go up the, the stairs in the lift whereas the rest of the court had to take the staircase. And uh, she looked at some of the older paintings, particularly of the gold ground paintings, which are still in the first rooms of Uffizi. And she said, how darling, how my darling Albert would have loved to show them all to me. Sure, he knows I'm now worthy of them. So when she looked at these paintings, she thought of Prince Albert. Uh, later, she had gone much earlier, a couple of, uh, in 1863, where I think was her first visit to the um, uh, to um, um, Florence, and she actually visited San Marco, and this is from her diary, and she came to look at the um, frescoes of San Marco. She never went upstairs in the dormitory there. I don't think they had those left, they still don't. Um, therefore, uh, she just stayed on the ground floor, but she was particularly impressed by this fresco of Silentium, the one in which uh, one of the friars, St. Peter Martyr, uh, is uh, holding his finger and slips to say, you know, be quiet. And it's a fresco that actually uh, really uh, impressed other artists too. So this is a, a, a Manet's print of it, probably from 1862 or 64. So he was there around the same time as the queen. Of course, the myth of Fra Angelico does not really just date from the 19th century, but much earlier, we might say one of the first people to promote it was uh, Luca Signorelli. Angelico painted some of the uh, vaults, uh, some of the paintings in the vaulting of the San Brizio Chapel in Orvieto, uh, but he was never, uh, he left the project unfinished, he went on to do other things, so um, a couple of decades later, it was finished by Luca Signorelli, the famous scenes from the Divine Comedy in it, uh, but when Luca Signorelli fresco this seen on the wall as opposed to the vaulting, which shows the um, Antichrist, uh, he actually included his idealized portrait of Fra Angelico next to his own self-portrait. Uh, Fra Angelico um, uh, died in eight, uh, eight, uh, 1455 in Rome, and he was buried in the Dominican Church of Rome, which is Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, in fact, you can still go there to visit his tomb, which was carved shortly after his death. So it's really quite something that, first of all, he was a Dominican friar. Secondly, he was an artist that he had in the middle of the 15th century, such an important tomb. And here he is. And every time I go and look at that tomb or a photograph of it, I look at it and I wonder, was he like a nice person? Would have I enjoyed visiting uh, meeting him? Even though I, I'm, you know, I probably would have because I'm supposedly uh, an expert on him. But it would be interesting to ask him a few questions. But you look at that tomb and you kind of have second thoughts. Um, first of all, because if he looks like he's standing, then they put the pillow there. But of course, that's not his fault. Um, and I'd like to compare it, though, to some other self-portraits. He never painted self-portraits, as far as I know, self-portraits of artists from his own time, uh, to just to see if any bit of their personality comes out. Uh, this is the Filippo Lupi Coronation of the Virgin, uh, you know, Florentine visitors in Fizzi, you've probably seen it there. And there, uh, um, excuse me, uh, something went wrong. Whoa. Doesn't matter. Um, there is a self portrait of the artist uh, Filippo Lupi in it. Um, and you can see exactly where he is on the lower uh, left side. And uh, here he is there 
with his hands sort of on his uh, chin or uh, jaw there. And he's looking out. He, he looks like he, he has a curious figure. He's kind of interested in seeing because Filippo Luppi uh, was a friar like Fra Angelico, but he was a Carmelite friar. And he did join the order. Fra Angelico willingly joined the Dominican order. Filippo Luppi, who was born very close to the Carmine on Via della Dilone, his mother didn't have any money, so she had to put her sons in the convent. I mean, they're very, very little. Uh, we later know, you know, Filippo Lippi left it, he uh, got married to a nun and all sorts, and had a son, Filippino Lippi. So he's already the type of friar he kind of like, just from his bi biography. There is a Mazzolino's preaching of St. Peter in the Brancacci Chapel, and you look at that face too, and I always wonder whether that might be an actual portrait by Mazzolino of a very young Filippo Lippi, who obviously when Sasso and uh, uh, and Mazzolino were working in the Brancacci chapel since he was living in the convent. Must have been very curious about what was happening there and probably went up on the scaffolding as they were frescoing those walls. There's a, a combination of the two portraits, the south portrait and this other friar painted by Mazzolino. And this is the friar as an old man. Uh, Filippo Lippi, one of his last works, the Domitian of the Virgin, which is in the apse of Spoleto Cathedral. And he has some kind of a nice friendly uh, face to him uh, and, and makes one wish that um, you could be friends with. We look at Frangelico, of course, it's a picture of someone in his, uh, in his uh, uh, cassock, in his uh, habit there and also as a person who's dead looking from beyond the grave. Uh, he doesn't look like, this is a contemporary of his, his Filorete. Filorete did the same time Angelico, about the same time Angelico was working in uh, St. Pete in the Vatican. Filorete was working on the bronze doors, which are the main central doors of St. Peter's. Uh, and when he finished those doors, he did a little relief at the bottom, showing himself at the top of the recession and all his, all of the members of his team dancing away, something that we can't quite imagine to be um, um, Frangelico doing. Frangelico did, however, paint portraits, and we'll be looking at a number of them tonight. Uh, these are, this is from a little panel, which is in London, which is part of a predella, in other words, the base of an altarpiece, which is, um, was originally in San Domenico in Fiesole. And these are two members of the Ali family, but the family, the Florentine family that paid for the altarpiece, who actually just lived down the street from here in the palazzo that used to, uh, used to belong to Paolo Barocchi called Spes. And so um, you can see that occasionally Angelico, at very early point in his career, is trying to also create portraits, but not at the same level as the one we just saw in, by Mazzolino or the ones that were painted maybe a decade or so later of uh, self-portraits by Filippo Lippi. However, Angelico painted lots of pictures of Dominicans, of friars, and he himself was a friar, and he was very interested probably in how a friar should behave. And in a funny way, his portraits are portraits of the life of a friar, of, of a Dominican um, religious man. And you can see numerous of them in, uh, as Saint Dominic. We don't know whether they're portraits or whether he's using someone in the convent as a model. But you see Saint Dominic praying at the bottom of the cross, flagellating himself with his arms open, praying, et cetera, et cetera. It, he's telling all the other members of his um, convent how they should behave, how they should um, enter into essentially what is meditation in front of these images. The images should make you go beyond in your devotions. Or this one, each one is in a, um, in a, uh, um, in a, a separate cell, and so each one, Breyer had a cell of his own with one of these paintings. This one shows a mocking of Christ in which is kind of in shorthand in which you see someone slapping Christ's head and another person spitting. But in the bottom are a Dominican friar and the Virgin Mary, and they're not even looking at the scene. They really have seen the scene, but then they're lost in their own thoughts. And it's a really wonderful interpretation. 
what you can see there is that a little bit of that arch shape of the top of the painting is um, goes into the bare vault of the ceiling. And this is not actually where it was like it was before. And I think we have to uh, remember, you can see also in this other one in which it shows the resurrection of Christ. And if you've been there, I'm sure probably most of you have. This is the, um, the dormitory as it is now. You can see the uh, trust roof, the wooden roof there, and that all the cells now have um, doorways. Those doorways are not original. All the cells that were open, in other words, you weren't able to ever have a moment of privacy in this place. And there was there was no, the roof was put in, these bare vaults for each cell were put in the 18th century. So actually, as a fire would be going down the corridor here, past like this famous Annunciation, you would not only get to see that, but you would get to see all the different images in the cells. And it was like, in, particularly in the case of the, of the cells in which you have all the crucifixes. You like one of those foot books in which you see one after the other like that. It would be quite a wonderful effect. And actually, you can kind of get it today because the doors are, are, are open. Um, and there's been a lot of artists, actually, who've been interpreting some of these uh, um, things. And there's one wonderful artist from Irish artist, but she lives in London, Cian Bonnell. We did a whole series of, 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 of photographs of herself uh, in different positions, in the same positions as um, the friars in Frangelico's paintings in, 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 the, um, in the dormitory. Also, uh, lots of another English artist, and I'm always showing English artists who did the W's. We actually have Italian artists in the audience now who did another interpretation too, is that. Um, uh, Richard Hamilton did a whole series of things which uh, are based upon uh, the pop artist Richard Hamilton, which are based on the Annunciation. And I'm showing particularly this Annunciation from this point of view because you can see how it works within the architecture a little bit um, as, as you go around the corner. And I think Richard Hamilton rather uh, uh, um, uh, works upon that. There you can see this is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he did something similar to that in the Anthony Dolce Gallery, which is in London. And this is how it looked, so that you can see you're coming around the corner rather like you do with the Fra Angelico um, uh, uh, Annunciation. Here, the Virgin is naked. It was actually me, again, her Annunciation by the telephone. And there, you can see that. And this is another interpretation, too. Now, I always wonder what Frangelico would have thought of it. I don't think he would have been shocked by the nakedness of the Virgin, but I think he would have been a little disturbed by the fact that the angels are women. Uh, of course, angels are not supposed to have sex, but we tend to think of them as guys for some reason. This is Frangelico. Um, as interpreted by Michel Dumas, a French painter in the mid 19th century. A sort of a languid person, a little lazy, I was lost in thought, et cetera, instead of this active, active guy like uh, Masaccio, as you see in uh, the Brancacci Chapel frescoes. This is Masaccio, he's very intense looking out and even casting a shadow upon the back wall there. That's a detail of one of the scenes of the enthronement of um, St. Peter Apostle. And that's a sort of thing that Florentine artists continue to do. They related to this Masaccio work, such as Botticelli did in the Adoration of the Mage, I call the Lambi. Adoration was actually originally in Santa Maria Novella, but now in the Uffizi. Florentine artists sort of want to position themselves in very much this sort of way. So let's get back to Fra Angelico. What's in a name? So Fra Angelico or Beato Angelico? And a good way of explaining this is, first of all, to say that's not his name. Secondly, that he's actually called Guido di Pietro by birth. In other words, his father was a guy named Pietro. He was called Guido. We know from a couple of documents, sometimes they called him Guido Lino, which might suggest he was small, short in stature, or might just be an affectionate way of talking. And then later, when he was a fully formed artist, 
already. He joined the convent of San Domenico in Fiesole, which was an observant convent. In other words, it was a strict convent of the Dominican order. And he became known as Fra Giovanni, frequently Fra Giovanni, the Fiesole to distinguish him from the hundred of other Fra Giovannis that they were. But um, interesting to see what's the difference between the Fra Angelico and the Beato Angelico. And the best way to explain that is by looking at stamps. So this is one of the first um, Vatican airmail stamps. They use Fra Angelico for it because it shows St. Luke from the Nicolaine Chapel up there in the class, like an airmail letter. So if the older people in the audience can tell the younger people what an airmail letter is. But um, there's a lot of other stamps there. There it is. A lot of other stamps. And you look at these stamps here. It says Beato Angelico Poste Italiani. Fra Angelico Poste Vaticani. So you would have thought that the Vatican, uh, the Vatican would have said Beato Angelico, Blessed Angelico, uh, but they said called him Fra Angelico. Whereas the um, the um, uh, Italians in in 1955, so therefore the anniversary year of Angelico's birth, called him Beato Angelico. Because he was beato by the people, by his own uh, friars, etc. But he was not officially blessed. So the Vatican are very scholarly, as they would say, about things like that. And, that, and during that year, they issued these stamps in which they, uh, was the same year they had a great Frangelico exhibition here in um, Lawrence, but also in the Vatican, where you, here you see a uh, Pius XII, looking at some frangelical paintings. And the Vatican, they continually issued stamps like that, in which they usually said frangelical as opposed to beato angelical. Later, they even issued a, a stamp, which I think is rather moving nowadays, for they used his flight into Egypt as a 1960 stamp for the year of refugee. So Frangelico has always been used in very topical ways that could still be done today. Here's another one of the post stamps in which uh, is based upon Gabriel, fully dressed at this time, uh, coming and bringing the Annunciation to the Virgin. It was finally only with Paul, Pope Paul II uh, uh, in 1982 that they made, they beatified Fra Angelico. So therefore, thereafter, they started putting stamps that said Beato Angelico. I know there's a bad photograph, but um, it does say Beato Angelico. They kind of fudged it a little bit earlier because they put on the card Beato Angelico, uh, but not on the stamp itself. So, in other words, uh, Beato Angelico is something that was he began to be called already very, very early on in the 15th and 16th, late 15th and 16th century after his death, but only officially made Be uh, Beato, the blessed Beato fight by Pope Paul, John Paul II uh, on, um, on, um, in 82. And therefore, his saint's day, so to speak, is on the 18th of February every, every year. So it could be our third February holiday. Right, let's look at a uh, something that happened wrong in 1960. And it's a bit of a movie. Let's see if I can. Do you recognize the movie? These are, of course, from Jalapos. It's a beautiful movie, La Forêt. And you'll recognize the other actor in a second, I think. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So, it rests on a plein soleil by René Clermont, famous film with Alain Delon. It all takes place in Rome and in Capri, I think, or in the, or the Malfi Coast. It's actually from the Patricia High. Um, Oh God, what's the last name? I mean, so, what? Yeah, that's <laughs> her uh, uh, purple moon, I think it's called, and uh, or, or purple sun, and um, it's a story, of course, of a murder, of of of, uh, of um, betrayal, um, a terrible story, Alain Delon playing the bad guy. So it's a wonderful sort of thing because it's not in Patricia Highsmith's original. A, a book, the Frangelico section, but uh, Rene Clement puts it in, and I think he's very much influenced from that big exhibition, 1955, which took place only a few years before, and a whole series of beautiful color publications of the Italian publishers were put, um, are creating at that point, and so he liked this sense of the innocence of Frangelico against the, the evil character of, of the character played by Delon, and um, it's a um, wonderful um, interpretation of that. This is the first scene of the Frangelico is actually shows the coronation of the Virgin, which is here in the Uffizi. And this movie and all this sort of um, exaltation of Frangelico's painting between the 1950s and the early 1960s was something that began to attract uh, a writer called Elsa Morante, who was a non Italian novelist, um, Alberto Moravia's wife, among other things, great novelist, probably better novelist in the room, right, than he. And she was called upon by the Rizzoli publishing firm to do the introduction to the opera Classici dell'arte, which has all the Frangelico's works in it. All these uh, books were had an introduction by, um, by, um, a literary person, a novelist, a writer, a critic, some point. And she was kind of worried, why in the world are they asking me to do it on Frangelico? So she senses. So, you know, paintings like this of friars with knives in their heads, of friars flagging at loading themselves before crucifixions, kind of little bunter. And uh, this is something that was not a uh, completely uh, a new idea to be repulsed by these things. Actually, Henry James, when he went to the Museo of San Marco in 1874, so a good 100 years before Elsa Morante was writing her introduction, said, I, she sat in front of this man and said, I sat out the sermon and departed. I hope with a gentle preacher's blessing. And then the next line in his diary is, then on the staircase leading up to the little painted cells of the Baratheon Jericho, however, I suddenly faltered and paused. Somehow I had grown adverse to the intenser zeal of the monk of Fiesole. I had no more of them that day. I had no more macerated friars and spear gashed uh, sides. So he just left. He, like Queen Victoria, didn't bother to go upstairs. Well, Elsa Morante really did study uh, Frangelico's work and try to figure things out. And so uh, uh, she imagined Frangelico as a cosmic traveler. So I have to remember, there was a little moon landing just a year before. And uh, but asked if he was revolutionary, because she was also thinking about all of the student protests, particularly in the, the great battle of Valle Julia, which was one of the major um, student um, uh, demonstrations of Rome at that period, um, that uh, was Angelico a revolutionary. And she said, you know, he's a cosmic traveler because he showed all these angels going up the sky, but began to think, well, is, does he hold up as a great artist against 
Florence's Renaissance revolutionaries, the architect Brunelleschi, Donatello, Masaccio. And sometimes you begin to wonder whether he does, because here we see the Prado Annunciation, we see Adam and Eve, they look like friendly types, they're going out of the expulsed from heaven at the same time as the Annunciation. They don't have any of that pathos that you see in the Masaccio, which is in Brancacci Chapel, even though Angelico in some ways adapts the same position of the figures and things like this. And you have to remember too, there is a psychological play. There is E looking back and glancing back towards the virgin who will redeem her great sin. So Angelica does it, but on a lower tone, he doesn't uh, than Masaccio does. Um, and actually, he follows the biblical account much more closely, because if you read Genesis, it says, unto Adam also, and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe, clothe them. So God was the first fashion designer, essentially. He made these clothes for Adam and Eve. So Angelica is a theologian in one way or the other, and he goes and looks at these, um, uh, the biblical source before he does this painting. Let's look now at a couple of Angelicos a little bit more deeply. This is a beautiful painting, not very well known in Rotterdam. I do hope it comes to the, uh, to the exhibition in 2025. Interesting thing about it has some coats of arms that were down here that are erased. And if you look very closely with the microscope, which I have done in Rotterdam, uh, you can see that the coats of arms are, are actually the Martelli family. The Martelli family um, it was a very important 15th living of the Palazzo Medici, very much aligned to the Medici, and they also had their coats of arms uh, executed by Donatello, uh, which is now in the Bargello. And here, in fact, was the Donatello uh, coats of um, the, the uh, Martelli coats of arms down below, indicating that this painting was probably produced for the Martelli. And we know that the Martelli were the early supporters of Donatello himself. So the Frangelico were doing a painting for the Martelli, not a private, a private commission, not for his friary. Uh, he would have come in contact with some of the major artists of the time. I think he would have had many other opportunities to do so as well. So as you look at this painting, which is a typical painting of a find in Florence of late 14th or early 15th century of the Madonna uh, with um, angels in his case, with dying child. It's like the ones they called Colma, they were for private settings. Uh, they're like the one uh, by Lorenzo Monaco, this other one by Rossello di Jacopo Franchi. But you look at it, and I'd like to note in particular the very fine quality of light and modeling of this flesh tone. And uh, first of all, and it, for Angelico probably studied with Lorenzo Monaco, you can see that he's really gone a step further in his um, painting of the flesh uh, through these white highlights in particular, and this three-dimensional modeling, which seems to have some sort of inner light or light being cast upon it. Um, he would have known Gentile da Fagliano was working here in Florence, um, uh, uh, I think, excuse me, not, he would have probably seen works by Gentile da Fabriano, the Marquisian artist who was working in Florence at that time, particularly for the Strozzi family, as in the Adoration of Magi, which is in Fitzi. And if you uh, compare that, uh, scenes, for instance, the young king there, they're creating the same sort of effects, even though the the photographs are different, um, different tonality to them. I can you can see that he's beginning to paint very much like Gentile, and you can even see that he might pick up some of the um, hand gestures of Gentile's work, such as this detail here. But Angelico is a young artist at this time; he's casting his net widely, and therefore he's looking at also some of the older Florentine art particular think of those vases of, of flowers there in front of the Virgin. And he may have even been thinking about uh, the, the great Giotto, uh, Ogni Santi Madonna, in which you have this very, very three-dimensional vase, uh, held in this case by the angels rather than resting on the floor. 
and this is the difference in size, of course, between the two paintings. The other thing is you look at this baby Jesus. He is struggling, he's falling off his mother's lap, very typical of a kid who is hyperactive, sort of as babies almost all tend to be. And I think he was probably looking at some of the great uh, terracotta paintings at this time, uh, I mean, the sculptures at this time, which artists like Donatello and Nani di Bartolo, Ghibertes, another example, were able to use the terracotta to experiment with these wonderful positions between the Madonna and the child, and very active, almost athletic, as in the case of the central one by uh, Donatello. Um, and this is something that Angelico is um, uh, looking at and using as a basis for discovering a new way of painting himself coming out of the workshop of Lorenzo Monaco. So we'll look carefully now at the descent from the cross, uh, which is, some, is called also the Strozzi altarpiece. It's now in the Museo di San Marco. And it was displayed, or it originally positioned, in the same space as the adoration of the Magi by um, Gentile da Fabriano. But first, and I'll talk about that in a second, but first look at the, um, this painting here. It, you can see it has a triptych shape and it has pinnacles at the top. And those pinnacles are not by Angelico, but by Lorenzo Monaco. Therefore, the painting was begun by the older artist Lorenzo Monaco, who probably died around 1424, 25, and left the painting, as far as we know, unfinished. But he finished that part of the body. He also finished the predella or the base, which I, I don't have in the photograph here. So Angelico was working within a scheme that was already predetermined. It looks like the painting was going to be one of those classic altarpieces in which you'd have Madonna and child in the center and probably saints on the side in the triptych shape uh, with the arch at the bottom. Um, this painting and the Gentile de Fabriano were originally in the chapel of the Strozzi family in Santa Trinita. So here we have Santa Trinita and how the, uh, the church now as a Baroque facade, but how the church would have looked in the 15th century can be seen in Guerrandaio's um, fresco in which he actually sets it in Piazza Santa Trinita just before the bridge. So on the way coming here, if you're coming from that direction. Um, um, but, um, and it was for the Strozzi, who didn't live in Palazzo Strozzi uh, today, that was built later and for another branch of the family, but this 17th century house where the Mont Blanc and the Pucci shop are now, it was being completely transformed as the actual original location of the Strozzi house. So they had their chapel essentially across the street from the church. And actually in the Predella panel, in the, now in the Louvre, shows a little bit what that street would have looked like. And probably the white building there with the private garden on the top, on the far um, um, left hand side of the painting, is an, gives you an idea of what it originally would have looked like. So we're right there in Piazza, or Via Tornabona, I guess, on the corner of um, uh, Via Puerto Rosa. And if you go down on the Via Padrone, you see, uh, which is the side, you can see that this chapel here, and that chapel has a coat of arms on it. It was designed by Lorenzo di Berti, and that is the Strozzi Chapel, which is the sacristy of the church as well. And you have the coat of arms right there next to the windows. So it's declaring to everyone, this is for us, the Strozzi family. Most of us now go in either through the side, that side enters on Via del Parione, or you go up uh, from the main uh, doorway in, pia in, the, in, the, from the, in the piazza, and then you go uh, and you go by. We, you would normally go uh, see, just stop there and look at Gil and Dyer's frescoes, which are, of course, painted a long time afterwards. But you can see on the lower uh, left and right hand side of that side, a little bit of the doorway. And that's a doorway designed by Ghiberti that would bring you into 
the chapel itself. Actually, no one ever looks at it because I was looking for Gill and, uh, Gill and Dye, but actually has very beautiful carving of leaves with acorns and things like this. And if you read in here, this is where the Strozzi altar piece would have been. There is two chapels uh, or two altars, and it would have ha been had uh, uh, between the two is this tomb, and that's the tomb of Paolo Strozzi's father, called Nofri. Paula, P A L L A, was the uh, person who was considered actually the richest man in Florence at that time, who became um, the great patron of the arts and commissioned these two paintings for his chapel, the Gentile da Fabriano and the um, and the um, um, uh, Frangelico. So here we go and look at this triangle. What do we see? We see a scene of the uh, descent of Christ from the cross, set in a beautiful landscape, which you normally look at, you'll see is very close to a very much Tuscan looking landscape. Doesn't really look like um, Jerusalem. But the subject of the descent from the cross, how did other artists depict it? Here you have a run in which shows the descent of, from Volterra, very, very early medieval work of art, in which uh, everyone's standing up and Christ is being taken down from the cross. They're still pulling out the nails. Here's the same sort of story with by Pietro Lorenzetti in Assisi, except Christ's body is now um, bone, practically, and the, the woman particularly the Virgin Mary in blue, is, be, is holding his head, whereas Madeline is, is kissing his feet. This is Giotto. Giotto just shows really the lamentation, doesn't show the descent from the cross. In fact, there's no cross there. That's a Giotto that's still in the chapel in Padua. Giottino, this is from the, um, now the Uffizi, but from a painting that was in the Church of San Remigio. Uh, in which you can see it is the lamentation. Christ is all right off the cross, but you actually do see the cross there. On this new contemporary to Frangelo, whose paintings the one done by Roger van der Weyden, would have been for a church in Brussels. And uh, he, uh, Christ is, is in almost horizontal prone or uh, that way, and the Virgin is as well, fainting, not even looking at the scene she is so overcome with emotion. And so later, in Filippo Lupi, which kind of looks like he'd been looking at the Frangelico in the sense that they're both working with the composition with the ladders against the cross as so they're bringing down the body of Christ. Filippo, I said Filippo, I meant Filippino. Uh, Loroso Fiorentino, which is in Voltaire, does pretty much the same, same thing. But we can see that for these later paintings, it kind of there's a distant memory of Angelico's composition. Here's the Bac Bacchiacca, a, fifth, a 16th century Florentine artist, doing pretty much the same, except we also have the two crosses, in this case, the good and bad thief. Two people are taking away the bad thief, whereas the, uh, I mean, the good thief, whereas the bad thief is just left there nude on the ground. And then there's a pontormo, no cross, nothing, but Christ is being brought towards us as if it's going to be, he's going to be laid upon the altar. And in a funny way, we get that same effect with a frangelico too, because the price is so, so very, very large. But on the front with the frangelico, we've got two sides to the composition. One side show is very much like the Giotto, but without Christ's body. We have the Virgin who's seated on the ground, about ready, with a shroud there, about ready to receive Christ's body. In the next moment, she will be born just as a virgin does in the Giotto painting. But here on the other side, in other words, the um, right-hand side of the painting, there's something else which is completely different. We've got a man leaning down in red in costume and in dress that would have been typical of the 1420s and 30s. Another man holding a... Uh, 
a, a crown of thorns and the, and the nails, and then a group of people in different dress of the same period. One person might be in a Middle Eastern dress, and another man with a red hat in the background. I got a more detail. Looks like he's a, man, a figure, a typical mango figure. So it represents people from all around the world in a funny way. And this man seems to be showing the, um, the instruments of the passion uh, to these people who are foreigners, almost as if he's explaining to them what is happening. He's almost like a Dominican flag or the, flag, the order of the bleachers. I just want to show you that usually this is given to Donatello, but some people give it to Desiderio de Settignano. I think the modeling of the head of this figure is very much like that uh, sta um, bust statue, which is in the Bargello. Um, look at so this painting the painting of, of the descent from the cross was in the same chapel as the adoration of the magi by um by uh, gentile da fabriano and if you look at the detail on the right you can see also there are people behind the youngest uh, king there who are in contemporary costume who are probably in fact members of the strozzi family the family that commissioned the painting. This was put on in 1423. They're either Paolo Strozzi and his father Nofri, or maybe Paolo Strozzi and one of his sons. But it seems to show the uh, different generations of the same family being included in the adoration of the Magi. This is something that even happened in later paintings, such as the Botticelli I showed you briefly before. And in fact, this must be the case here. So you see that detail there. You see the man with the red hat and the man next to him holding the hawk are probably portraits of members of the Strozzi family. And indeed, I believe that this painting of this um, figure with the red capuccio, whatever you like, or I call that, holding the instruments of the passion is also is probably Paolo Strozzi. And I have a little bit of evidence for that. Because, yeah, here, if you look at right here, where I think we can see the pointer, maybe. Oh, no, why is the pointer coming up there? No, but right there on the gold border of the figure next to him, but intersecting with that crown of thorns, it says Magister, which would be Messer Paula. So it actually is almost identifying this figure here. So therefore, who is this guy? He's leaning, uh, he's kneeling, he has his one arm open, he's sort of petting, uh, beating his breast. He has the rays, which for Frangelico meant a living person as opposed to halo of a dead person. Uh, and he has young, he has red curly hair, and he is the most prominent person in the painting. More prominent, you might say, than his father behind him. Now, I just revealed what I said by saying his father behind him. But I believe it's actually Paolo Strozzi's son, Lorenzo. Lorenzo, who is going to be the next major figure in the family, and who this painting was installed in 1431 in the family chapel, the Strozzi sent up barrels of wine to the convent of San Domenico and Fiesole to pay for it. Uh, they only paid with wine, they didn't pay with cash, it was a barter system. And um, that very year, Lorenzo Strozzi got married. Well, Alexandra de Bardi, considered the most beautiful woman in Florence. Um, we don't have a portrait of her, though, who is also considered also one of the most intellectual women in Florence, known for her uh, um, uh, philosophical discussions or theological uh, uh, philosophical discussions. Before that, uh, Lorenzo had become the most uh, um, uh, visible person, young person in town, too because of two things. He won a joust which had taken place in, San, um, in the Piazza Santa Croce uh, in 1427 or 8, I believe. And in 1427, he was appointed to official position at the government. 
which was a position which was um, the head of the catastrophe. In other words, he became the head of the tax collection agency, which was established that year. And all he had to do to go to work was go around the corner to the Palazzo d'Avanzati, because in 1327, when they established the tax office, they established it in the lower floor of Palazzo d'Avanzati. So it's around the corner from what was the ex Chozzi Palace. And if that happened that every single Florentine head of family had to go to the Palazzo Gavinsati and make a tax declaration saying how much money they earned, how many people were in the family. And therefore, that's why we know so much about Florence in the 1420s and throughout the 15th century. So this painting was really a painting about the importance of the Strozzi within Florentine society and celebrating the new generation of the Strozzi family in the figure of Lorenzo Strozzi in red, kneeling before the scene with his father behind him. Um, the Strozzi didn't have much uh, didn't have much time to enjoy this painting because it was a star in 1431, and in 1434 they were exiled from Florence. In other words, we know in 1433, Cosimo de' Medici was, uh, because of different political upsets I won't get into, was exiled from Florence for a year. He lived in, in Padua, and he came back, uh, um, uh, and, he ex and he exiled, who took revenge against all the people uh, that uh, were against him, including the richest man in town, Paolo Strozzi, and his son, Lorenzo and other members of the family, and they never came back to Florence. Paolo Strozzi moved to Padua with one of his younger sons, and Lorenzo Strozzi, I believe, was exiled to southern Italy, where he was later murdered for something completely different. So we have Angelico just very quickly changing allegiance, and we have the Medici. So the Medici also employed for Angelico, the essential paid for San Marco, but we'll look finally just at the painting of the high altarpiece of San Marco, and particularly how Cosimo de Medici is depicted in it. This is just recently restored in the Museo di San Marco. You can see Virgin and Child with the, uh, the uh, triers on the uh, right side and various saints on the left side, and then Cosmos and Damien on the carpet, beautiful Anatolian rug, in which you can see there's the border with the red dots, which are actually the red Medici Palais. And we have the inventory of the Medici Palace, in which we know they had rugs like this, in which they sew borders with their heraldic symbols along the edges. The altarpiece was all broken up and dispersed, so there's been various reconstructions of what may have looked like. Two of the predella panels are actually in here in Florence still, the one showing the burial of Cosmos and Damien, another one, a miracle, uh, which I think has been shown here before um, by Duncan Geddes. Here's actually a view of San Marco as it would have looked at that time with the church and then the new cloister by Michelozzo next to it but without the last wing of the, of, of the dormitory uh, finished yet. The painting was in the uh, San Marco, but we don't really have a sense of what that was like. It was redesigned, it was already existed the church, but it was redesigned by Michelozzo for the Medici, uh, but uh, it now has this Baroque aspect to it. But originally in front of that high altar, there would have been a room screen, which would have separ separated, which was a real wall, would, would, would have separated the monks, the friars, from the, the, um, um, the lay public. We have some pictures, some idea what these wood screens look like. There in the middle, you can see a 15th century, actually Spanish miniature showing the Dominican church in which the wood screen or choir really closed off the back part. The other painting, the other picture it shows the small little church, the Dominican church of Santa Maria del Sasso in, in, in Bibiana in Mugello, in which is one of the only churches in all of Italy in which these 15th century room screens exist. So the real walls 
in which you have one opening there, which is frequently closed, and then that other side is where the monks spend all their time, or the friars, we usually call the Dominicans friars. If you go behind the uh, Baroque altar, altar of San Marco, you do have remnants of the 15th century aspect of the church itself. In fact, you can see those doorways which have the Medici Pali above uh, there in the architrave. And we have to imagine that somehow uh, this is, we, uh, our painting would have been in a setting like this. This is just me playing around with the PowerPoint or like Angelico painted here, the circumcision in what was probably a setting very much to what was Nicolozzo's church design, original church design. So you can imagine the painting there. But the problem with it was, probably not for, for the friars because they could go and look at, at all, everyone. It was the problems for the public. The you and me were not friars. We would have only be able to look at through the doorway of the wood screen. So we would only really see a little bit of the painting from afar, maybe the Madonna. But I think the most important thing we would see is this person. That is a portrait of Cosimo de' Medici as his patron saint, Saint Cosmas. And what is he doing? He's looking out and he's gesturing towards the Virgin. And he's saying, I paid for this. I called the Pope up. I got him to come for the opening night of the Convent of San Marco. And I even got him to give us indulgences. And there's a big plaque near the altar still today. You enter the church of San Marco, you get an indulgence for your time in purgatory. If you manage to make it that far. And he is not the person who wants to be the most prominent. So you have to think it's kind of like a peephole. And through that peephole, we see Cosmo de Medici. In fact, if you look at that portrait of Cosmo de Medici, it's much more advanced than the paintings I had showed you by Angelica before in terms of portraiture, much more specific about its features. And I think he was probably had some knowledge of the art of, um, of the art of from the north, and particularly of Van Eyck, who's such a great portrait painter, and who also worked with oils. And if the content of this portrait, it hasn't been tested, looks to me as it's not just the old temper paint, but also the use of oils. And we know at the same time, there's a great council of Florence, so there were a lot of clerics from Northern Europe, as well as um, uh, people from, uh, from the Byzantium, because they were trying to unite the Greek and Roman churches at that time. And one of the cardinals who was participating in that council, which took place in the Dominican Church of Santa Maria Novella, was Cardinal Nicol El Bergati. So his angelical could have seen his portrait and maybe also thought of that and really thought about that type of painting for his own portrait of Cosimo de' Medici in the painting. Here's another uh, painting, I don't think it was specifically in Florence at that time, but just an example of Van Eyck's way of doing features of an older man, which are equivalent somewhat to the one by uh, Angelico. So here, oops, here we have the Strozzi altarpiece and the Medici altarpiece. And here we have Angelico around 1431 on the left side for the Strozzi in the late 20s or 30s. And then from about 30, 1437, 41, we don't have the exact date, a decade later, working for the two richest men in Florence at that time. Um, and uh, changing his style, but I was working for the richest people in town. So we get back to Elsa Moranto's um, question, was Angelico a revolutionary? Well, see the type of revolutionary painting like, um, like Masaccio. We can't really tell from his portrait. Masaccio tells us he's a revolutionary. Here, Angelico is dead in, in his peaceful slumber. But in a funny way, I think we have to say he was a revolutionary, but he's a revolutionary 
like the American Revolution and today being George Washington's birthday, rather like George Washington. He's the one who stitched the whole thing together, as opposed to John, the, the real revolutionaries like John Hancock or Thomas Jefferson. Now, I know a lot of these people, at least in the American world, are, uh, we look at them very differently than I did when we were children, or, or Grant would deal with that myth of the cherry tree in George Washington. But um, in a funny way, it's equivalent to Ms. Mitchell and, uh, and uh, Frank Jellico at that time. And um, in there, but just wish you a happy night. So, thank you very much indeed, Carl. And as always, um, we'll now do the questions and answers, um, and the Zoomers will join us. Um, so, if you're in the room and you want to, uh, Make a comment, ask a question, put your hand up, and I'll bring you the microphone so everyone can hear you, including the Zoomers. And for those on the Zoom, if you want to talk to us, you can uh, come on to the chat, um, or you can, uh, if you like, unmute yourself and talk to us direct. We'd like to hear you in the room if you do talk to us. So, um, do we have anyone who wants to go first? In the front row here? You do. Thank you. It's a great talk. Um, to what extent did William Sonomico's art? influence Angelico's art. Um, very, very much. Uh, uh, Lorenzo Monaco was from uh, the late um, trade change, in other words, from the 1380s on. Angelico, we're not exactly sure what, what date he's born, so we can't really say when he entered. Ange but I believe he entered Angelo, I mean, Lorenzo Monaco's stop workshop probably around 1410, maybe even a little bit earlier. And he actually worked side by side with him and possibly even contributed to some of Lorenzo Monaco's paintings. By 1418, well, uh, Angelico becomes an independent artist. But if you, I didn't show it tonight, but if you go up to San Domenico in Fiesole, and look at the first great altarpiece he did, which has now been, we configured a little bit because in the 16th century it was redesigned by, um, by Lorenzo di Credi. But the central scene showing the, the Virgin and Child with angels is almost an exact copy of it, Lorenzo Monaco. Thank you. Um, we have a we have a comment on in the chat from Ruben. Would you please comment on various enunciations, Ferenzi, Cortona, and Madrid, and why the artist uses this topic on several occasions? Well, the, the Annunciation is, of course, a central tenet of the Christian Roman Catholic faith. So it's something that is frequently depicted. Um, it was much loved in Florence because on the 25th of March in that period, it was considered the um, first day of the year. We counted the year from the 25th of March. Um, but it's also a very important for the Dominicans. In all those cases, the Annunciation um, Altarpiece in Fiesole, uh, which is now in the Prado, uh, the Annunciation Cortona, and uh, the Annunciation Fresco in the dormitory, which I showed you, were for the Dominicans. And they would sing the, um, um, Maria, but particularly the Salve Regina in front of it every night at, um, at um, the uh, God, what's the service at the evening, evening song service? So it is, a, it is something that they're particularly concerned with. And anyone in the room? Any more thoughts? Yeah, we got some at the back here. Do this one first. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for the exhibition, is, the, is 2025 a particular anniversary of Frangelico? And has there been a lot of new discoveries or new documentations or new attributions that uh, sort of at the basis of a major retrospective of his work? Um, 2025 is not really a, a special year. Um, it's not connected to an anniversary. Um, it is 70 years after the 1955 exhibition, but um, I don't think we can count that as a real anniversary. Um, 
Sean Jellicoe is work, I would say, uh, there are not many new documents that have come out about Frangelico in the last decade or so. But uh, a lot of work has been done on, on technical uh, te a lot of technical discoveries have been made through restoration of some of his work. In fact, we, Descent from the Cross, the Strosa Descent from the Cross is now in restoration sometime next week. I'm going to go see, uh, look at up with the underdrawing, in other words, infrared reflectography to see it's underdrawing. I was up in Washington last week and looking at another painting I didn't show of called the Cook Tondo, shows the adoration of the Magi. And we found a lot of very interesting new things with the technical discoveries of the underdrawing. The Prado Annunciation, which I showed just briefly, for instance, we did lots of technical investigations and we found a tremendous amount of changes in the composition. So I think the new discoveries tend to be made through restoration or, um, or technical research on Angelico. Yes, well, thank you. We have the Gentile about the Fabian altarpiece on the one side, and then would have been the Lorenzo de Monaco finished by Francesco. And we say we don't know the theme of the Lorenzo de Monaco, but the, the deposition was chosen. Is that usual then, counterpart to a nativity? Was there a, a, do we have any idea of why the deposition or what might have been there before by Lorenzo? Okay. Um, first of all, I'm not. The panel that is, of the deposition, which is by Frangelico, there has been some but brief technical investigation. Doesn't seem to be painted before by Angel by Lorenzo Morango anywhere else, as if he took away a painting and then started another one himself. So either that panel was left blank, it had already been, because when Carpenter makes an altarpiece to make the whole thing, and then the artist comes to it. And Lorenzo Monaco didn't do that part yet. Or if he did run, they just completely replaced it. The way it goes with the triptych form makes me think that the original planning would have been a Madonna and Saints, particularly based upon the predella, which I didn't show. We would know it would have probably be Saint Onofrio. Who was the um, patron saint of Paulus Strozzi's father, Lofri? In the middle, the, um, the adoration of the child, in other words, a nativity scene, and on the other side, Saint Nicholas. Uh, but um, obviously, that doesn't exist anymore, it was never painted. Why they chose the deposition is I'm not exactly sure. Well, it, the point and the deposition are, are on the right side in which you see the crown of thorns and the um, nails of the cross might relate to the fact that in the chapel next to it, which is called the Ardingeli Chapel, doesn't exist anymore. The Ardingeli family actually owned a reliquary, they said, of the reliquary of the true, true cross. And the Altarpiece was painted by an artist not very well known called Giovanni Toscani, but that altarpiece was paid for by Paolo Strozzi. He wanted to make the whole church look good for his own chapel. And among other things, his daughter, in other words, Lorenzo, one of Lorenzo's sisters, married into the Ardinello family. They were also exiled by Medici later. But that's a very almost too precise explanation. So I'm not. I'm not sure why. The deposition is not that common for an altarpiece thing. Yeah, we have another um, question. Yeah, we've got some, some more questions in the chat, which I'm going to do now. But before I do that, I uh, understand there's been a bit of a problem with the time calls on Zoom again this evening. And, yeah. um, I'm speaking a little bit close to the mic, then I don't know if that makes it any different. You might um, wave at me if it does or not. Um, anyhow, I apologize. Maybe we'll look at it again. It's, it seems a problem which keeps recurring. I don't understand why, even though we're spending a lot of time and money with technicians, but we'll continue to try and uh, make it more reliable. Um, uh, and I'm going to also put up the, uh, the link to Just Giving for those of you, of you who would still like to make a donation this week to help us out. 
notwithstanding the technical problems. Um, and then we'll return to the, the questions. Um, two are, are come through. Brenda Moore McCann, could you elaborate on how Saints Cosmo, Cosmas and Damien uh, became the patron saints of the Medici as well as of doctors? Um. Well, uh, for, for obviously, Cosmo is called Cosmo. Uh, but it, it, it's interesting if you look at uh, names in the Catastro 14 Price 7, Cosmo is not a very common name for us. Nowadays, you know, you know real true Florentines, a lot of them might be kind of Cosmo, where if you go to Bologna or Rome, you probably don't encounter too many of them named after that. But that's because Cosmo de Medici is called Cosmo. Mm -hmm. There is some indication that Cosmo de Medici was born a twin, and that um, he uh, his twin brother was named Damien who died at birth. And we know that Cosmo de Medici actually celebrated his birthday on the same day Cosmo and Damien, rather like the Queen, to celebrate her own birthday on her own actual birthday. Uh, but. Um, it's an, it's a set, even though they were there's much devotion to Cosmos and Damien, and there's Basilica in Rome, an early Christian church in Rome dedicated to them. Um, there was not much visual tradition of de, 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 portraying them before the Medici. Interesting. And though the Medici were bankers, their name sounds a little bit like doctors. <laughs> 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 well, the Medici were actually, but the guild they were members of. Was the Guild of Medici? At, that might be another explanation. So, so it was maybe. the Guild of the uh, yeah. uh, of the doctors and physicians? Oh, yeah. Anyhow, so um, another question on the chat from Livia Morgan: uh, Did the painted cells at San Marco have no doors at all, or are the current ones simply replacements? And do we know what the ceilings of the cells looked like before the 18th century vaulting? There were no ceilings before the 18th century. Um, well, I'm not sure if I say in yeah, probably 18th century vaulting. There was no ceilings. It was just open. And um, I can't tell you whether they didn't have any, when they put those doors in. The present doors are probably 20th century. Maybe late 19th century. But... We're getting towards time to go and get some wine, which is always uh, welcome. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will take one more thought or question if anyone is bursting to join in in the room. The room seems to be done. Any more on the Zoom? Neil, come in. You no, can I donate see. online. So just a question for <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so I, I think it's probably come to the time when we can thank uh, Carl very much for a most interesting lecture. So thank you. And as always, it's my, now my pleasure to invite you to come through to the Sala Acton, where the wine is ready from our sponsors, uh, our partners rather, uh, in this season, which is the Colonialet Wine Estate over in Ruthen. I'm um, sorry you can't do the virtual wine, but I enjoyed glass and honey. Um, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>